Well, a hurricane's life is, is a little bit like a thunderstorm. It has to start somewhere. So you go back to an origination, you get a thunderstorm over the warm ocean waters, and initially then you got one or two storms, eventually they start to organize. That's then called a tropical disturbance. Suddenly that disturbance takes a life of its own, it starts to circulate and rotate, feeding off water temperatures that are in the mid 80s, and next thing you know you have a tropical depression, winds of 30 miles an hour or greater, it hits 40 miles per hour, you've got a tropical storm, and if the winds in that circulating center that are, uh, I guess, circulating around its outer walls eventually do reach 74 miles an hour, you have the birth of a hurricane. There are three main areas that we do watch. Of course, the United States, we watch the Atlantic Ocean areas and the Gulf of Mexico and the Caribbean. But also, you've got to keep in mind, of course, the waters of the Pacific as well. Eastern, Southern, and Western Pacific, all hot spots for where hurricanes do form. You, one key to have any type of tropical system developed, though, is you have to have water temperatures at least, at least 80 degrees, ideally 82, for anything to organize. It's a little bit like the seasons when you think about the hurricane season itself. If you take fall, winter, and spring, you kind of have a buildup to when the maximum high temperatures are reached in the summer. It takes kind of a lag of a month or so. That's the same with the hurricane season. The primary peak of hurricane season is reached right about September the 10th. And after September the 10th, the decrease is very slow. You can still have systems all the way into October. We've had them as late, uh, even the last five years, as late as uh, early December. For most landfalling hurricanes that we see in the United States, uh, the greatest threat comes from two things. It's either storm surge or it is flooding rains. Two biggest things. Um, occasionally though, we end up with these landfalling hurricanes and we also get spawn tornadoes. And that was a big uh, case when Katrina made landfall. There were numbers of tornadoes, not only in Florida, but also into areas of Louisiana, parts of Mississippi, and then eventually as it made its further way inland. Um, so all three are big threats, but really number one being rains. Often you're talking 10, 20, maybe even more inches of rain, and that's what causes widespread flooding, which of course, as we all know, flooding the number one killer of most people across the, the entire world. Oh, and Isaac made landfall. It was a storm that was only category one. It did have some wind gusts that hit about 110, 115 miles per hour. Uh, but when you compare that to Katrina, Katrina spent much more time over the Gulf of Mexico, and it became at one point a Category 5, the strongest storm that we can have as far as the tropical system goes. Uh, unlike Isaac, though, that was only a Category 1. So really in size difference, uh, the intensity, big difference between the two. But if you actually look at the width of the storm, they were actually the exact same. 400 miles wide were both storms, and each one of them capable of producing 15, 20 inches of rain. If you look at the size of a hurricane, just how big they are, if you're actually to be able to weigh, say, how much a hurricane might weigh, uh, we could take, let's say, a scale and put it out there. In theory, if you took the water weight inside one hurricane and you compared that to something that has weight, let's say, elephants, it would take 41 million elephants, more elephants that are even on the earth, uh, to give you the total weight of the water inside one hurricane. That is a huge chunk of change.